the project that we're currently working on um, has a few different aims which all kind of tie in together. So for me, the crux of it is looking at the invertebrate, the trade in insects. Um, so we're trying to look at the motivations behind it and also figure out um, the players who are part of it and the market forces involved. Um, in order to have a hook to this project, we focused on one particular charismatic species, the titan beetle. Um, it is highly valued and also very interesting because it's very it's very little is known about the species so it's mysterious but at the same time it's heavily traded and um, so we're focusing on that as our, our, our focal species which is why we're here in French Guiana trying to study its movement. So we're looking at the natural history of the titans as well as kind of their economic value and who's involved with collecting them, trading them or just keeping them for themselves. We don't really know how many species share the planet with us which is quite a remarkable thing given that we've been uh, collecting and cataloguing pretty comprehensively for 200 years or so. Um, what estimates tend to go for now is between five and eight million species in total um, in, in, the, in the world. They're mostly talking about the complicated celled things, the eukaryotes. Um, in terms of insects, we might be thinking perhaps five to six million. I'm slightly, I'm slightly guessing there, but the, the estimates fluctuate, but let's say five million. Um, in total for insect species, there's um, just under 900,000 have been formally named and those will, most of them will be represented in collections somewhere. I think we've got maybe 400,000 different species of beetles alone. They perform the biggest uh, diversity, greatest diversity of insects as we know it, but I'm sure there's many more to be found in the rainforest canopies. So I have a cabinet at home, a Victorian cabinet, uh, which has drawers in it and in the drawers are, are lines of insects. So I have maybe, I suppose, five or 600 different specimens altogether. And I have a uh, store box as well full of different specimens. Most of them are different, not replicates. Um, some collectors of butterflies, for instance, are desperate to get every single variation of the colour pattern and every sort of um, uh, weird form of the colour pattern they, they can find. I never had that kind of obsession, but I wanted to make sure I had a good representation of the UK fauna. So the collections here in Cambridge are important for a whole variety of different reasons. Um, one of the main ones, I think, is about communicating science. That's certainly a big part of it. Um, we have the public display collections, which are very important. Um, we have the reference collections behind here, um, which we do, we do allow members of the public in to see as well, but they, they tend to be more for special interests. Um, once you've seen 100 flies, the average member of the public tends to lose interest. But if you're really keen on flies, then you might, you might come here and spend several days. Um, the most important specimens, perhaps, amongst our collection are so-called type specimens. These are individual specimens from which a species has been named. So when you come to re-describe or to describe a new species, often researchers will actually have to come back in and look at that material. So that's the crown jewels of our collection here, I suppose. One of the things that the, our collections here are being used for a lot at the moment is to study long-term change. Um, so obviously we're living in a world which is um, changing very rapidly. Biodiversity is declining very quickly. And of course, to know how quickly things have changed, what things were there before, you often have to reference collections like this. Et, euh, et donc, euh, comme, comme tous les samedis, on est ici pour euh, faire nos relevés de, de nos pièges de la montagne des chevaux. Donc, comme on fait depuis plus de dix ans maintenant. Donc, euh, nous avons des pièges qui sont en place depuis euh, de nombreuses années et nous avons récupéré les échantillons pour les analyser. Il y a pour l'instant trois types de pièges qui fonctionnent là-bas. Les pièges à banane, les pièges d'interception de type malaise et les pièges lumineux automatiques. Les échantillons que nous avons collectés ce matin sont des échantillons euh, que nous trions sur place. Et une fois que nous avons trié, nous euh, répartissons les, les différentes fa familles parmi euh, de nombreux experts que nous avons euh, à peu près partout au travers le, du monde, notamment aux États-Unis et en Europe. It's been an amazing experience uh, getting to see these beetles. The biggest one that we've caught has been around 15 centimetres, which is just an immense size for a beetle. Um, they're amazing to observe, mainly because they're so incredibly aggressive. Um, they 
have these tremendous jaws which they just try and clamp onto absolutely everything. Looking at them, they really don't look real, just the absolute size of these creatures. Euh, bah pour l'instant, euh, concernant le titan, on ne connaît pas grand-chose. <rire> La seule chose qu'on connaisse sur le titan, c'est qu'il est attiré par, euh, par les ultraviolets. C'est pour ça que nous les prenons au piège lumineux automatique ou au piège lumineux classique avec des lampes à ultraviolets. On sait que cet insecte est actif de, du mois de décembre jusqu'au mois de mars à peu près. Pendant la saison des pluies, du début de la saison des pluies à, à fin mars à peu près. Voilà. On ne connaît ni, euh, ni les larves, ni l'arbre dans lequel les larves évoluent et se développent. On ne connaît rien. So the potential implications of actually finding out more about titans and where they live is something that we've discussed amongst ourselves quite a lot. Because is this something we should actually divulge? Uh, donc, uh, il faut effectivement... Uh, il faudrait faire attention de, de ne pas dévoiler peut-être certaines informations si on, on savait demain dans quel bois la larve du titan pourrait se développer. Parce qu'effectivement, euh, cela pourrait donner des mauvaises idées à des gens à des fins commerciales de trouver justement euh, où vit le titan, de, de cultiver les larves, enfin de les faire se développer à des fins commerciales. Pour vendre ensuite les imagos comme, euh, voilà, pour, les, pour les collectionneurs ou, ou autres. Voilà. And that is something that could have an impact, not just on the titans themselves, but on the kind of wider ecosystem, because we don't know where they fit in. I think the, the absolutely crucial thing is to know more about the population dynamics of the, spe of the whatever attractive species. Uh, usually, of course, the species which are big, ornamental, nicely colored, or somehow interesting, would be of interest, commercial interest. And what is not always very well known is uh, how the, let's say, uh, removing several or more individuals would actually influence the whole population. Uh, we don't have enough and sufficient knowledge of that. On sait qu'il y a en effet un, un tourisme uh, de naturalisme pour uh, l'observation et le prélèvement des insectes. Par contre, on n'a pas d'études réellement qui le quantifient, donc on a du mal à évaluer réellement quel impact ça a sur le territoire. Euh, on sait qu'il y a euh, des, euh, des structures d'hébergement qui sont un petit peu euh, euh, basées justement sur euh, les touristes qui viennent pour prélever des insectes. Maintenant, on n'a pas d'études qui le quantifient, et on n'a pas d'évaluation réelle de ce que ça génère comme euh, marché euh, financier et commercial sur la Guyane. I have seen people uh, who come here for scientific reasons. They catch insects to study them. And also people who catch them for their own collection. So I, I would say it's like 50-50. I know a guy who came here, here to uh, collect uh, assassin bugs to, uh, to send them to USA University, who dis to who uh, research research them to uh, find a cure for Sargas disease and also a vaccination of it for it. So it's it's good. It's uh, like medicine kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, but most of them they really collect for their own collections. I see so many people who come here. They catch all the things they can and uh, they go back home with their suitcases full of insects and I don't know if it's good or bad because I don't really know how much there is in the forest and I don't know the population of them but it seems kind of it's sad to watch it a little bit <laughs> yeah I think it's fair hobby for anyone to do uh, until it, uh, it doesn't harm the natural population somehow. If, it's, uh, if it uh, sets uh, population or species in danger, then it's wrong to do it. Alors, à notre connaissance, la, la science, en tout cas en ce qui concerne l'entomologie, avance en grande partie grâce au travail des amateurs dont nous faisons partie. 
nous faisons donc des collectes d'insectes relativement limitées, bien qu'avec des pièges performants, et euh, je pense que nous n'avons pas d'impact sur la faune. En tout cas, notre activité de piégeage, euh, qui a un but purement scientifique, n'a aucun impact, même localement. On, nous piégeons sur la montagne des chevaux depuis dix ans, avec des pièges automatiques ou des pièges traditionnels, depuis dix ans, toutes les semaines, avec des pièges automatiques. Et euh, il y a toujours autant de bêtes. Et chaque semaine, tout, tous les mois, nous trouvons de nouveaux spécimens et des espèces nouvelles. Donc euh, on pense qu'il n'y a vraiment aucun impact. Et il y a toujours autant d'insectes dans les pièges. La situation en Guyane, elle est assez simple, c'est que comme il n'y a aucune réglementation, euh, on est un peu le pays phare, euh, le pays de destination numéro une pour euh, venir faire euh, du prélèvement d'insectes, puisque sur les pays avoisinants, les pays frontaliers, le Brésil, le Suriname, le Guyana, il y a des réglementations en place et euh, il est interdit de venir collecter des insectes et euh, de les exporter. Donc on est vraiment un pays euh, phare euh, dans l'Amérique du Sud pour venir collecter des insectes. Il existe euh, pas mal de, de, de captures à des fins commerciales en Guyane, mais ça représente un volume relativement limité. Et euh, nous avons la chance de ne pas souffrir de législation particulière sur ce domaine en Guyane, ce qui a des avantages et des inconvénients. Ça a des avantages euh, parce que ça permet à beaucoup d'étrangers amateurs d'insectes de venir collecter en Guyane facilement. Mais le désavantage, c'est que la prise en compte des insectes, notamment dans les études d'impact, est pratiquement inexistante. On, on a commencé euh, depuis quelques années maintenant à, à s'inquiéter du potentiel impact justement de, du prélèvement abusif d'insectes. Et depuis deux ans, euh, en l'occurrence, on a eu des saisies qui ont été opérées par les douanes et par la police de l'environnement sur des quantités très très importantes d'insectes euh, à la sortie du territoire. Donc on a en effet commencé à travailler avec les scientifiques, avec euh, les experts en entomologie sur euh, la nécessité de mettre en place une réglementation qui permettrait de euh, freiner, d'empêcher euh, ce « pillage » entre guillemets euh, de la ressource en insectes. Je pense que c'est un point crucial, starting point. Otherwise, you end up in a situation where you have to simply Uh, anticipate that potentially every individual may be important for the population and in that situation you should be quite severe in implementation of the protection but in many many cases the experts will tell you I mean this is quite stupid because uh, I mean few individuals of these species make absolutely no harm for the population uh, while If you accept that, I don't know, the agricultural practices are changed or more chemistry is used, this has a kind of aerial impact, which is much, much, much more worse. And this is not addressed and you address the individual to be transferred. So, I mean, this is the area where we need to invest quite a lot of, of research to know actually uh, what is this balance between individual and population. Quand on a commencé à, à discuter de cette réglementation, de ce projet de réglementation avec, euh, avec les scientifiques, avec les, les experts, euh, le constat, c'est que euh, le constat des experts, c'est souvent de dire que très vraisemblablement, euh, ces espèces-là euh, n'atteindront pas un statut de menace, euh, nous permettant de les identifier comme des espèces à protéger. Pourquoi Parce que le territoire de la Guyane est immense et que la partie euh, auquel euh, la population va avoir accès et auquel les, les collectionneurs vont pouvoir accéder est extrêmement réduite. Donc en fait, pour impacter euh, une espèce, il faudrait avoir une empreinte sur le territoire beaucoup plus importante. Et aujourd'hui, au regard de la petite partie du territoire auquel les collectionneurs ont accès, vraisemblablement, euh, il y a assez peu de chances qu'on vienne impacter euh, une espèce. Le, le territoire guyanais fait 85 000 km2. Et à 95-96% recouvert de forêts, de marais, de marécages, de savanes. Donc c'est très grand. <rire> Je pense que jusqu'à ce qu'on ait pris tous les insectes. I I think uh, first of all I think what I have seen in French Guiana, it is contributing maybe not too much but still it's contributing to local economy. There is a tourism related to it. There are people coming to there not only to collect just to see to be there to 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 observe. So this is certainly not insignificant. Uh, second, uh, uh, the, 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 what is absolutely clear until it is really, really needed, a 
total prohibition usually leads to the boost of the illegal trade. So this is probably not the solution. If needed, some regulation I don't think uh, is, is a bad thing. Uh, the question is how it is really implemented and enforced. La réglementation euh, qu'on qu essaye de mettre en œuvre et qui devrait voir le jour cette année euh, a un focus particulier sur le titan parce qu'on s'est rendu compte qu'il y avait euh, une, une, une attirance particulière euh, du territoire de la Guyane française à cause de la présence de cette espèce qui est du coup assez facilement euh, observable en Guyane et qui coûte très cher sur le marché. On sait qu'un titan sur le marché peut se trouver facilement autour de 500, 600 euros, voire plus l'individu. Donc on sait que les personnes qui viennent en Guyane, avec la capture d'un seul individu, peuvent déjà rentabiliser leur voyage. Donc on a vraiment voulu que cette réglementation ait une restriction particulière sur cette espèce pour justement euh, freiner euh, le commerce et euh, justement le, le prélèvement spécifique sur cette espèce. And then uh, the, the question is obviously what it can do with the prices. I personally don't think if the quotas will be set up uh, in a reasonable way, that it will dramatically influence neither the, let's say, the interest of the people to come and see that and collect eventually, nor the, the, the prices in the market. Because all in all, when we speak about titans, uh, there are very, very, very few individuals on the market. It... Par contre, on a essayé de trouver des quantités maximales, des quantités qui nous semblent uh, raisonnable entre guillemets, en tout cas pertinente, euh, à ne pas dépasser pour ne pas euh, engendrer un commerce euh, lucratif euh, de la collection de ces insectes. Euh, on, on voulait aussi une réglementation qui soit facile à mettre en place, parce qu'en définissant euh, des espèces précises, euh, les forces de police à l'aéroport ou dans les postes qui vont venir faire ces contrôles, ils n'auront pas les connaissances pour pouvoir reconnaître les espèces. Donc c'était euh, une importance de pouvoir euh, cibler seulement euh, quelques espèces vraiment facilement reconnaissables, le titan, euh, la terraphosa, ce sont des espèces que à peu près tout le monde peut reconnaître facilement. The biggest difficulty, the biggest challenge of insects as a group is the diversity. One might be perfectly uh, you know, legal to trade and the other might be illegal, or one might be threatened, the other one might not be threatened. And it's quite difficult for a customs agent who traditionally deals with you know, uh, might be bags of rice or beams of wood or might be some other types of material to then have also the ability to identify, distinguish these, these animals, right? To even have the expectation anyone um, in a border, say, or a, a customs facility would be able to pick up an insect and say, oh yeah, this, this is this animal we should be able to trade or that animal we should be able to trade. You know, it, it's, it's incredibly daunting. Right? So, so I see that as perhaps some of the biggest uh, challenges the scale of IWT, wow. <laughs> um, I would say that in all honesty, we just don't know. And that's what I think most researchers or conservationists are going to say around the world. How big is this and how much impact are we really having on these species? I think it's far greater than we realize. And I think that that's what makes it so dangerous. Um, you go into any small community and you're seeing species at market um, that are not anywhere on the, on, on the map in terms of what researchers are necessarily looking at in terms of impact. So insects, for example, if you walk around a street market in Thailand, you see buckets and buckets of insects. And likely those came from either neighboring regions or, or other countries. Those are still part of illegal wildlife trade, or I shouldn't say illegal. Those are still part of wildlife trade in some capacity, wildlife usage, and they're being transported from where they were found. And we, we really just don't know what that extent is. And then kind of you go up along the chains to an, a, a species that, you know, a beetle that's being collected and, and transported halfway around the world for, um, for a specific individual. Um, that's it's very different. Um, but I would say that I think that the impact is just as important or as large scale as something like deforestation, especially because it's targeting specific individuals, which can have an effect of, you know, an ecosystem collapse. Um, actually, from having spoken to a lot of people before coming on this expedition or as we've been um, developing the project, 
the general um, in the general public a lot of people aren't even aware that um, insect collection still continues uh, many people think it's quite an old-fashioned thing that maybe happened in Victorian times but no longer exists so actually there's actually very little public awareness of um, the whole kind of market in itself so in the UK I think is a very much a niche hobbyist interest uh, they, there are big insect fairs which are well attended but in terms of uh, someone like uh, bird watching it's probably still a small affair um, don't know what the value is the, of the insect trade is some of the insects I've seen being traded are quite expensive and some of the collections can be very expensive but again it's small numbers relatively small numbers of people who are buying these things and trading in them I think there's a bigger market for educational supplies, so things like stick insects and cockroaches and locusts, which you see in schools. Um, whether that's part of the same sort of thing, got a slightly different feel to it. It's not about sensational, wow, amazing insects. It's simply things, this is the variety of life. And they're bred uh, locally usually, and they're uh, supplied to schools directly. So that's a slightly different thing. I think if we're talking exotic species, which are traded internationally, it's uh, probably a relatively small trade uh, compared to some other um, items being traded. And of course, there is a, also a farming agricultural interest in things like bumblebees being moved between countries and honeybee colonies being moved and queens and so on. So insects are shipped around all over the world for different purposes, sometimes uh, for better or for worse, because you get you know, the, the distribution of parasites and pests, etc. But in terms of dead insects, set insects, insects caught in the, uh, the rainforest, I would say probably relatively small trade, um, not insignificant, but niche. I think often there are important impacts, and I think we should we should be clear about that. But I also think we also should think about clearly about the role that some of this trade plays in in livelihoods, right? And where would we be, or what would we do if we were in the same situation, right? Because of course, you know, here in the UK, where we all have, you know, a lot of people have have uh, uh, you know enjoy a high standard of living, and we have to worry about where our next meal is going to come from, um, you know, it's relatively easy to say, oh, we should just ban this. We shouldn't. We shouldn't be using that resource or that resource. So, but in reality, is that in often where people's livelihoods depends on using those resources, on you know, cutting down that tree or collecting this animal, um, then of course the choice is is very different, right? And people will make the choice that will get them a little bit of an easier life. If will, you know, that means uh, having. You know, shoes in their, in their feet, or sending their children to school, or having a slightly better ha you know house, or being able to uh, uh, afford a motorbike, for example, to go to the market. Um, that of course means that they they probably will have high incentives to collect to collect those uh, those animals and those plants. The pin butterfly trade is quite a big trade, but now um, in lots of countries like uh, America, Papua New Guinea, all those sort of places. Um, there are butterfly farms set up, so whole um, farming areas have been set up to breed these butterflies. And what that's actually done is because it's managed, 10% of whatever they breed is put back into the wild to keep wild populations going, and then the rest are sent out to the pinned trade or to butterfly parks, which is what we're going to be doing, showing tropical butterflies flying around. And the pupa may have come from Papua New Guinea, but we know that they're ethically sourced and then it's actually keeping the populations of that butterfly going in that country as well as giving subsistence farmers um, a way of living and, and sending their kids to school and improving their lives. So there's a lot of good things um, about um, uh, that sort of trade. However, there is another side to that, of course, when uh, the uh, interest in the species is so great that it results in uh, crashes locally or more widely in the population concerned, uh, that can affect not only that population but also any uh, prey species that, that prey upon the population. It can have quite a series of knock-on effects. So with the titan beetle, uh, that's preyed upon by uh, large uh, fish, large birds, a variety of uh, mammals in the uh, local area. So if there were uh, enough collection going on of that particular beetle in an area, that could conceivably affect uh, prey species as well. The only thing I would say is that if, um, if a scientific organisation could collect females and males and breed them in captivity, whether uh, in a different country or where they come from, the great thing about that is if, if a female beetle lays, and we don't know how many, but based on rhinoceros beetles, maybe 
30 to 40 eggs. In the wild, you might find only three of those become an adult beetle. But with captive farming or captive rearing, out of those 30, 40 eggs, you're likely to get 30 to 35 adults. And if they could spend four or five years doing that and then release it into the general population, that could actually grow the population enormously. And um, it could even feed the, um, the, the trade in pinned uh, animals or uh, keeping livestock um, so that people don't go looking for them. So again, you might think, OK, well, collecting a few insects here and there is not going to have much of an impact in that case. And by and large, providing the collection is managed, providing people know why they're collecting, and it isn't just for the sake of collecting, and I think it can be a really valuable thing. You need reference collections. You need to extract these organisms from their natural environment to understand them more in many cases, as well as observing them in the natural environment. But observing them in the natural environment for many invertebrates can be very, very hard. They're very small. They come out at night. They live in, in places where we can't see them. So you need to get to see them first of all to find out what you've got there. And I think you need to understand, you need to have that sense of audit of knowing what's there first before you can do anything about saving them. Otherwise, you, you can't really make a case about saving them. You don't really know what biodiversity is there, what it's doing in its natural habitat and how the habitat all works together. Imagine a situation where we say, OK, tomorrow we send an army of scientists out. They discover everything that needs to know about insects, right? If we ever get to a place where we say, oh, this bee species over here we can't trade, but that bee species we can't trade, and you need to have 10 years of training in order to distinguish them, you know, how, how, is it gonna, how are we going to then operationalize control and regulation of that trade you know, legally in terms of customs and border enforcement, right? So I think to me, if you ask me what is the difference, for me that the sheer number of species and the lack of, I think that's maybe the key thing, right? So we, we've gone, you know, how many years have we gone to get all birds and mammals assessed? You know, decades and decades to get all an assessment for all birds and mammals. Now I, amphibians, I believe, is completed as well. Reptiles, we haven't even completed reptiles, right? And we're talking about, again, a few, a few thousand species, right? What is that going to look like when someone says beetles? Right? And all of a sudden it's not five or six or seven or 10,000 species. All of a sudden it's 10 times more or, or 50 times more. You see, I think this issue of scale, the, the, the sheer number of different units that we're dealing with is what's going to make um, the management of the trade a completely different challenge, like, like unlike anything I think we, we've seen. Perhaps the, the, the logic equivalent would be a lot of the plant trade, for example, where we have big groups like orchids, for example. I think that demand reduction is definitely key to long-term change, but I think that having policy change and structural change is needed as well. So you have to have a mindset shift. You have to have someone not wanting it anymore. And it doesn't necessarily have to be for a conservation reason. It doesn't have to be because they recognize it as this awesome species that they want to protect. It could simply be because they don't want to bother with having to get it from an illegal channel and it seems like it's faux pas anymore to use it. Taking large numbers just for the sake of finding differences or because you fancy the look of it, I don't think is justifiable anymore at all. Um, I think if we're farming things and to some extent sustainable extraction, I think is one of the terms used in the recent research, might be justifiable just about in terms of providing income and maintaining uh, the places where these things are found. But large scale, manufactured insects for the sake of collection, I don't think is any more justifiable than anything else like collecting ivory these days or collecting bird's eggs. I think that's old, it's out the window, we should move on from that. I've got a colleague who puts this very nicely, which is if a library is burning down, you don't start cataloguing the books. Um, and, that's, and that's, I think we're at that point. We're, we're, we're very close to losing an awful lot of our global biodiversity. And any, anything we can do practically to reduce that loss is now a number one priority, I would say. If you get rid of a lot of insects, lots of things will change in our planet. Uh, dung won't be recycled. Plants won't produce fruit, although some of them may, may still do that. And the world will be a much lesser place. So I think all in all, it's that reason why people 
don't look at insect conservation as being as important as all the big things like rhinos and elephants and tigers and lions because you can see them and they're portrayed as such and there's been a lot of work about saving them and because they're obvious to us. Whereas a lot of the, the smaller things, the things with six legs and eight legs and more, we don't see them quite so much. And when we do, we're not really sure about them and some people are a bit frightened of them. They think they're going to do harm rather than good, which I think is really sad. But I would hate the Titan beetle to be another one that goes extinct um, because of lack of awareness uh, before, virtually before people even discovered its existence. I think that uh, there are probably no choices that are risk-free, uh, but the risks of not knowing anything, uh, given the uh, increasing deforestation and environmental destruction going on around, around the globe, uh, the risk of not knowing there's a need to conserve a particular area is probably greater uh, than the risk of fueling demand uh, for a particular species, which would be the other risk. So this has been a really interesting experience for me because it's really opened my eyes to the variety of people who collect for so many different reasons. Um, before coming, I was very much on the impression that it was mainly people who were naturalists and interested in their biology who collect, but actually the diversity of the different people who do it has really surprised me. So you, we've met some incredible naturalists who are going out to places like this and collecting and describing new species or sending specimens around the world to different specialists who might be able to identify them, which I think is really, really valuable work. Um, one person in particular who we met, I found very interesting because he seemed a lot more um, interested in the experience and the journey of going collecting. So he was talking to us about um, different people he's met on his journeys around the world to collect insects and that was more about um, being outdoors and doing that rather than the collection itself. Um, however, we've also heard about whole groups of um, people who come together from across the world, so from countries in Asia, to just collect as much as they can. So they'll just light trap and get whatever they can and bring it back and um, they'll sell some, they'll keep some for themselves. Other people who seem to do it because they just find the invertebrates really beautiful and they kind of want to have them as a as a a beautiful item in their house um, and also we've heard about people who for whom um, insect collecting is an important um, source of income so just a huge variety of people doing it in different ways for very different reasons